Any reason so many people are wearing toques inside? <laughs> Getting cold, Yuri? <laughs> I'm sick at the moment, so yeah, that's so 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 that's why I look ridiculous. Getting cold, Yuri. I'm sick. At Hi, everyone. Okay. Hope everyone is doing well. This is the. Uh, uh, Canadian Foreign Policy Hour, and I'm coming to you from uh, Jojage, which has long been a, a meeting place of the various uh, uh, First Nations, otherwise uh, known as uh, Montreal. And uh, we have a special guest tonight, uh, Ben Norton, to uh, talk about um, to talk about. Uh, uh, Peru and the coup that's taking place there. But before that, I will go through a, a few different developments in Canadian foreign policy. We uh, on uh, this week, the Canadian government um, once again uh, voted against the, a UN resolution condemning. Uh, neo-Nazism, 120 countries voted for it, and uh, Canada was one of 50 countries to vote against. And um, a couple days ago, uh, uh, Jagmeet Singh was was uh, doing a press conference in, in Montreal, so I uh, attended here. As supporters sending over a billion in weapons to Ukraine, I supported Canadian Special Forces on the ground. Uh, former Canadian soldiers fighting, uh, intelligence sharing, uh, Operation Unifier. Fire. Are you concerned about escalation, including the possibility of, of nuclear war? And why hasn't the NDP supported uh, negotiations and like a push for peace? Mm -hmm. um, so we, we are absolutely concerned about escalation. Like this is a very serious, where do we find ourselves here? Um, we had initially taken a position with the reluctant to support any additional weapons. It was something that we were we were a little hesitant. Uh, after we started seeing some of the atrocities, um, just the horrific killings that were happening in Ukraine, it became clear that the people you needed to build and defend themselves. And at that point, uh, we supported the, the decisions made by the, the government of Canada to give the people who came the means to defend themselves. Uh, but it was something that we came to, it was difficult for us to come to. It wasn't a decision that we took easily. And it was after seeing some of the really horrible atrocities that we made that decision. So, but, but does, that, does that go on forever? And, and, well, and why, why wouldn't you simultaneously be calling for negotiations? Well, we absolutely believe that there needs to be a negotiated resolution. Well, has Heather McPherson and, and Charlie Angus have been explicit in attacking people who call for negotiations on Twitter? Well, I mean, ultimately, we want to see peace. That's the goal. And, and so whatever it takes to get the peace is, is the goal. Uh, we also want to make sure people are able to defend themselves. Appreciate it. I just want to add one, one thing. Is why not support France and Germany and Turkey that are, like, pushing for actual peace negotiations? I mean, if you could, yeah, could call on the federal government to say, hey, why don't we, like, look into some of the European allies that, that are pushing more in that direction? Yeah, I think we should be looking for uh, any way possible to end the war. I think it's important. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, so that was uh, a couple days ago at uh, press conference seeing Obviously, there's lots of problems with what he says there. Uh, the fact that Canada or the NDP was pushing aggressive positions from before the February 24th Russian invasion. Also, if it's just a matter of atrocities, then you would argue that we should be sending weapons to the Palestinians or we should be sending weapons to, to the Yemenis uh, to, to respond to the atrocities and being perpetrated against them. Uh, nonetheless, it was I thought it was kind of interesting. He he he's he's kind of I wouldn't say contradicting, but he's not—he's not not saying exactly what Heather McPherson, the NDP foreign affairs critic, is saying. So that's, uh, I think, you know, sort of a good thing, uh, to the extent that it's uh, uh, different. Uh, another thing: uh, Canada voted against uh, a resolution, uh, a General Assembly resolution, calling for towards a new international economic order. 123 countries in, voted in favor; 50 countries opposed. 
kind of the same countries that voted against the, the neo-Nazi resolution. Um, and that's longstanding. Canada has opposed efforts to the UN. I, I wrote about it a bit in my Black Book of Cain Foreign Policy, efforts to sort of democratize the global economy, efforts to strengthen UN bodies that might uh, be able to put money uh, globally, you know, outside of the, the Bretton Woods infrastructure, the IMF and the World Bank, but other initiatives to sort of have aid and, and uh, whatnot channeled through the UN. Canada has opposed those efforts for a long, long time. So this is just a continuation. And, and obviously it makes clear that Canada allies with the, with the you know, G7 European uh, leading uh, capitalist uh, countries. There was an interesting development on, uh, on Friday or Saturday, the Canadian Global Affairs Twitter account tweeted out that, quote, Canada welcomes Japan's new national security strategy and increased defense investment that will significantly contrib contribute to security and stability in the Indo-Pacific. So basically, Japan announced that it was going to double its military spending and sort of, to a certain extent, jettison its, its, um, its pacifist constitution. And the Canadian government decided it needed to uh, endorse Japan's militarism. Of course, this is this is largely directed at China, and uh, they Japan is looking to get missiles that will be able to hit uh, uh, all throughout the Chinese territory, and uh, and so yeah, the Trudeau government's sort of celebrating that. There was also a report that said the you uh, know in, in Ottawa Citizen I think on Thursday or Friday that the government is uh, is moving along with a five billion dollar plan about purchasing. Uh, uh, new uh, spy planes from the Americans. Uh, so that, of course, would be designed to uh, spy, particularly on on China. We know in recent in recent weeks um, we have uh, uh, we have um, a focused uh, or recent months. Canada spy planes have been. Uh, the the C one forty has been spying on on China, and and there's been you know conflict with the Chinese government over that uh, uh, question. There was a, a, uh, a Canadian Dimension article titled, Is China a Threat to Canadian Democracy? Which explored this whole business that we've heard a whole lot about over the past uh, six weeks or so, month or so, about uh, China interfering with Canadian elections in 2019 that the Global News initially reported and then uh, Trudeau brought up with uh, President Xi at the uh, G20, and then there was the conflict with President Xi. Um, and, uh, and the article does a good job of basically showing that there's really nothing to it. There's allegations, but the substance isn't there about China actually having had any impact on the 2019 elections. Uh, it's worth, uh, worth taking a, a look at. As I mentioned last week, there's uh, the... Israeli NGO, a settler colonial NGO called Regavim, that uh, hosted a, a week of events in the Toronto area, both publicity events and and uh, and uh, fundraising events. It appears they they had their events on set, and there was a email campaign which some of you probably signed, calling on the Canada Revenue Agency to not uh, uh, keep giving tax receipts to this. This Israeli organization through a Canadian uh, sponsored organization called uh, Mizrashi Canada. And uh, so there was uh, there was people who went to the different events in Toronto during the week. And then on Saturday, Saturday evening, there was actually a protest. I, I heard about a dozen people or something like that protested the final event. Well, the Mayor Weinstein from the Jewish Defense League, who uh, who actually <laughs> we know who, who watched last week's episode of uh, of the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour, um, he 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 announced that there was going to be a counter demonstration to this uh, protest against this um, settler colonial uh, Israeli uh, NGOs event in Toronto. And the fact that uh, Mayor Weinstein, who used to be the head of the Jewish Defense League, which is a far right kind of fascistic group, uh, the fact that that um, he protested the or counter protested the protest, that's not particularly surprising. Uh, and not particularly noteworthy, but the fact that uh, James Pasternak and uh, Bernie Farber, James Pasternak's is a Toronto City Councillor, Bernie Farber, of course, is Canada Anti-Hate uh, Network uh, Chair and Founder, 
they tweeted out this, this obscene tweet basically saying that this protest against Regevin was just like going to a Jewish community and, and, uh, and protesting Jews uh, on, Shab on Shabbat uh, at a, at a, at a, in front of a Jewish school, uh, completely, of course, leaving out what was actually going on, which was, was a protest against a very specific organization. Of course, uh, Rabbi David Miviser was one of the people who, uh, who helped organize the protest. Um, but but it was it was it was this 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 claim that it was just protesting Toronto Jews uh, was widely circulated among uh, uh, the the pro Israel uh, crowd, including Bernie Farber, who who has still continues to have all kinds of credentials uh, 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 in the left. On Haiti, Bob Ray, Canada's ambassador, of course, was down in Haiti uh, last week. He uh, did a number of uh, interviews with Haitian media. Uh, and in Canadian media when he came back. And he's quoted, he, he met with uh, Ariel Henry, the, the you know, unelected, unconstitutional, unpopular uh, leader that was imposed uh, about a year and a half ago by the core group. He met with Ariel Henry, so giving Canadian backing to Henry again. And in, a, in, a, um, in an interview with CBC, Bob Ray, when he returned, he talked about how basically how Haiti needs to needs to build up its military, which is actually quite a controversial position because the, the Haitian military is a terrible history, and it's something that you know the Americans essentially created during their their occupation in 1915, 1934, and it's very much a position of the far right. Has been a position of the far right to to build up the Haitian military, but Bob Ray is quoted in this article saying, you know, what country doesn't have a military? Uh, mm -hmm. Which is which is ridiculous, considering we know Costa Rica is pretty successful, doesn't have a military. Iceland, I believe, there's about 20 countries that don't have militaries, and I think you know to varying degrees of 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 success with that. So the idea that the that social resources in Haiti, a country where a vast majority of people don't have access to health or education or you know even food for that matter, the idea that you'd be plowing that money into building up a military is quite a uh, uh, controversial position. And the fact that the Canadian ambassador to the UN believes it's his place to, just, to even pronounce himself on whether Haiti should have a military or not is also, of course, reflective of a broad um, imperial kind of uh, mindset towards Haiti. On the counter to that, there was actually quite a good development on the Haiti file in the Globe and Mail on Saturday. On the front page of the paper, uh, it, there was a headline that said, the last thing Haitians need is foreign intervention. And then in the opinion section, the about half of the page of the opinion section, the, the pullout opinion section, so you know, quite a bit of space, was devoted to a photo that probably most people have seen here, because I've, I've shared it around many times over the past couple of months, of uh, protesters carrying a, a casket with the US, French, and Canadian flags on it. And uh, and um, and so, of course, putting Canada's uh, position in Haiti into a controversial light. And the article that was in the paper was a good, you know, three thousand were a big long article, a, a kind of a good overview, uh, sort of you know, mainstream kind of sort of anti-imperial historical overview of Haiti. When it gets to more current times, the politics get a bit a bit uh, less clear, and they kind of leave out. Canada's role, they, they very much downplay the role of the 2004 coup in the current a crisis in Haiti. Nonetheless, a big, big step forward from what you, the usual fare in the Globe and Mail and in and most of the Canadian media. So that was quite a, I think, a positive development and, and, and a sign that even among sort of establishment kind of circles, there's an understanding that this policy that of you know, constant foreign uh, military intervention in Haiti that it that he, it hasn't been successful even from a even from certain you know capitalistic criteria haven't been hasn't been particularly successful and I think that there the as I have mentioned previously the Trudeau government seems to be uh, backing away from the question of of uh, of actually uh, uh, organizing this whole uh, foreign military intervention so. Uh, without further ado, I want to uh, bring on our guest, uh, Ben Norton, who is a well-known uh, journalist and, um, and uh, 
uh, filmmaker, um, uh, heavily uh, uh, focused on Latin America. He, he writes now, he's editor at uh, uh, Multipolarista. Uh, he previously was with the Gray Zone um, and uh, he has uh, uh, written a lot of good stuff in the last couple, uh, I guess last two weeks or so about uh, what's going on in, uh, in, um, in, uh, in Peru where we see quite a bit of resistance to this uh, Canadian uh, backed uh, um, uh, uh, ouster of elected president uh, Pedro Castillo. So uh, first of all, Ben, thanks a lot for, uh, for coming on. Yeah, can you hear me? We can. Great. It's a pleasure. And thanks for having me. So, so basically, I want to just start off with a bit about Castillo. So what are we, you know, who is Castillo and, and uh, uh, you know, sort of the surprise of his elections? And then before we get into sort of some of the more deeper stuff. Yeah, Pedro Castillo is really the first, really ever, there's debates about this, but at least in decades, the first indigenous descent leader of Peru. He's in some ways comparable to Evo Morales in Bolivia. People might know Evo. Um, he was, a, he, I mean, he still is a prominent figure in Bolivian politics and the leader of the movement towards socialism party. And he was Bolivia's first ever indigenous president. He's also a socialist. Pedro Castillo similarly comes from the Andean region. And historically, this is the region that has been completely ignored by mainstream bourgeois politics in Peru, which is dominated by not only wealthy elites, but also light skinned elites. And in fact, many of the recent presidents are themselves, you know, directly of European descent. What, um, a, a recent right wing president is named uh, Pedro Pablo Kuczynski. Um, it's an example. And there are other examples of Europe, you know, descendants of European colonialists. And uh, in, in some cases also in, in South America, descendants of fascists who fled after World War II. Um, so in the case of Peru, uh, Pedro Castillo represents the marginalized indigenous communities. He himself is a farmer and a teacher, and he became well known in Peruvian politics because he led a teacher's strike. And as the, a main figure in the teacher's strike, a leftist party, a socialist party in Peru called Peru Libre, which means Free Peru, decided to, to pick him as their candidate for president. And he was, you know, not even a third party. He was like a fourth, fifth party candidate. No one took him seriously when he ran for president. But because the vote was so divided in the first round, he ended up getting in second place and he became the other candidate against the far right fascistic candidate named Keiko Fujimori, who is the daughter of the former fascist dictator of Peru who governed from 1990 until 2000, named Alberto Fujimori, who was backed by the US. The Fujimori dictatorship dissolved democratic state institutions and created a new constitution that was written basically by all of the Chicago boys, the IMF and the World Bank, a deeply neoliberal constitution that basically made austerity and neoliberal economic policies part of the, the Peruvian state. And he also committed genocide against indigenous peoples. According to the government's own statistics, 300,000 indigenous Peruvians were sterilized by the Fujimori dictatorship, which was backed by the US and by Canada. And in fact, USAID, the US Agency for International Development, funded the so-called family planning operations that were used as cover for genocide against indigenous peoples under the Fujimori dictatorship. Well, his daughter, Keiko Fujimori, is the leader of the far-right Fuerza Popular Party. And she was the other candidate in the presidential election in 2021. And the left not unified behind Pedro Castillo and were able to defeat Keiko Fujimori. So no one thought that he was going to become president, but he, he did become president. And as soon as he entered office on day one, on January 28th, 2021, the right wing opposition began trying to overthrow him, launching different coup attempts, using the judicial system to wage legal warfare known as lawfare, and just trying to destabilize the elected government in any way they can. And that, of course, culminated this December 7th in a, in a congressional coup against Castillo. And there's a lot of misrepresentation of that. I can talk more about the details, but it was a congressional coup. And many of the governments in Latin America have recognized it as such, including Mexico, Argentina, Bolivia, Colombia, Honduras, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Cuba, and numerous countries in the Caribbean. 
have all condemned the coup against Pedro Castillo and still recognize him as the constitutional president, despite the fact that he's now in prison. He was imprisoned. He was sentenced to 18 months on so-called preventative prison. And he, 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 there was no real trial. It was just completely bogus, you know, kangaroo court, uh, suspension of civil liberties. And he had no due process when he was in prison. So this is a coup. It's not as straightforward as a Pinochet style military coup, but it's a coup nonetheless. And it's supported by both the U.S. and Canada. Yeah, so so basically they they didn't let him they didn't let him operate. That the goal from uh, they didn't even recognize Castillo from the election. I know the Fujimori's the uh, crowd didn't even recognize him, so they 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 said they he somehow had had uh, stuffed the ballot or something like that from from uh, from the get go. So 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 clearly they they didn't let him pursue a, a progressive agenda. I should say one of the the notable players. The I think his name is Behar, who was the initial. Um, a foreign minister, he called he called the Canadian backed Lima Group uh, the worst thing that that uh, had ever happened in the history of uh, Peru's foreign policy, which of course would not have made the Canadian government very happy. I think it. I don't know enough about Peruvian foreign policy to know if that's true, but clearly it was a very bad thing in, in Peruvian uh, uh, foreign policy. Um, and I know that that's one of the people that they went at, the right wing went at right off the bat, was they drove him out as a minister and they, you know, put incredible pressure on Castillo to not pursue a sort of a left, leftist progressive kind of kind of agenda. Um, so they, de they destabilized this government. Now, now that that seems that seems uh, uh, quite clear. It seems also that that he he you know he had he he it was difficult. He didn't he didn't govern particularly well. That there was decisions that were made that were not necessarily the best decisions made. Um, but the basics of the fact that elected president is, is 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 straightforward, and that in less than a year and a half, uh, that elected president is not there. Now, now, what do we know about the sort of U.S. government's kind of role? I know you reported on the U.S. Uh, ambassador being uh, meeting with the, the head of the military or the defense minister a, a day or two before. And uh, and and a little bit about that, the U.S. ambassador, you know, who this this character is. Yeah, well, I'm glad you, you mentioned the lead. Oh, by the way, um, I think someone else might have had, had their mic unmuted because there was some noise a few minutes ago. But anyway, um. I'm glad you mentioned the Lima Group. And of course, the Lima Group was largely created by the Trump administration using Canada, including the Trudeau administration, as a placeholder for the U.S., just a willing you know, uh, accomplice in this coup attempt against Venezuela. It was called the Lima Group because ostensibly it was uh, created in Lima, but it was actually the Washington Group or the Ottawa Group. And uh, Lima has left the Lima Group. So Pedro Castillo, you're right, he wasn't able to accomplish a lot, largely because immediately after he entered office, it was just constant coup attempts and destabilization against him. His ministers were changing basically every few weeks. He had five prime ministers. Uh, in the Peruvian system, a prime minister is called the, the president of the council of ministers. And in basically every few months, Castillo was forced to have a new prime minister. Um, now, in terms of uh, Hector Bejar, this is a very important point that you mentioned. Right at the beginning of his administration in August, so he entered in July 28, 2021. In August, just a few weeks in, the military, not just the right wing, the military pressured Hector Bejar, who was the foreign minister, to resign. Bejar is himself a longtime socialist. He's very well respected on the Peruvian left. He's an anti imperialist. He was helping to oversee the normalization of relations with Venezuela and ending this recognition of this U.S. coup puppet Juan Guaido, who technically the U.S. still recognizes as interim president of Venezuela. He's never won a single vote in a presidential election. He's completely corrupt. He has no democratic legitimacy. And Hector Bejar stopped recognizing him, normalizing relations with Venezuela, and the Peruvian military forced him to resign. And in August, just two weeks in to Castillo's presidency, Bejar warned this is the beginning of a soft coup. He warned that in an interview with the Peruvian media outlet. And he said the opposition's goal is presidential vacancy, removing Castillo himself. And that, of course, happened a year and a half later. Now, in terms of the U.S. role, we know that the U.S. government is strongly supporting this coup. In fact, on December 16th, 
U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken had a very friendly phone call with the unelected coup leader, Dina Boluarte, and reassured her full support, referring to her unelected regime as so-called democratic. And we know you mentioned an article that I published at mozipolarisa.com showing the U.S. ambassador to Peru named Lisa Kenna, who is herself a CIA veteran, meeting with the defense secretary of Peru one day before the coup. Now, you know, there's a joke, but it's true that people often have said there's no such thing as a former CIA agent. Lisa Kenna served for the CIA for nine years, and then she entered the Foreign Service working at the State Department. She largely worked in the Middle East and West Asia, especially overseeing operations in Iraq, which definitely should make us, you know, raise a few eyebrows. And she also worked in Jordan and Egypt and Pakistan. And then later under Donald Trump, she was appointed ambassador to Peru and Biden kept her on as ambassador to Peru. And she, the day before the coup on December 6th, she met with the, the defense minister of Peru. And on the day of the coup, which I'll explain briefly here, the completely corrupt, undemocratic Congress, which has it had a 7% approval rating in September, tried to launch its third congressional coup attempt against Pedro Castillo in just over a year on December 7th. And in response, Pedro Castillo dissolved the Congress, which is allowed according to Article 134 of the Constitution, which ironically, he had been trying to change from day one. That was one of his main demands. And one of the main demands of protesters who are now flooding the streets of Peru is a new constitution to replace the right wing constitution created by the Fujimori dictatorship. So Article 134 allows the president to dissolve the Congress in cases of obstructionism. And if he calls for, for new elections, which is exactly what Castillo did. Now, the corporate media narrative and the narrative immediately spread by the U.S. Embassy, which immediately responded with a public message condemning Castillo when he tried to do this, which is an example of meddling in the internal sovereign affairs of a foreign country. The U.S. Who is the U.S. Embassy to, to say whether or not the Peruvian leader has the right to invoke an article of the constitution. That's a direct example of meddling in internal Peruvian politics. They created this narrative that he was a, a would-be dictator and he was trying to have you know, dictatorial power for himself. But if you actually listen to the statement that Castillo gave on December 7th, you can see in the video, he's alone. He's not surrounded by military officers. He's not, this is not like some kind of you know, military dictator. He's shaking in the video. Clearly, he's terrified of the consequences of what could happen against him because he knew that if he didn't dissolve Congress, he was going to be overthrown in a coup. So he was in a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. He cited, cited Article 134, and he said he's going to dissolve the Congress, and he said that he's going to have elections as soon as possible within four months. So the idea that it was he was trying to be a dictator is preposterous. He also announced the beginning of a process to create a constituent assembly to create a new constitution, which has been the main demand of the Peruvian people for many years now. And then, of course, what happened? The military overthrew him and the police imprisoned him, and he was subsequent, subsequently charged to 18 months in preventative prison without real trial. So it was a coup, but because it wasn't a direct, you know, uh, Pinochet style coup, it, there is a kind of gray area there that leaves room for propagandists in the Western media and the US and Canadian governments to claim that that Castillo was trying to do, launch the coup, which is not accurate. Now, in terms of what the this meeting was, we of course don't know exactly, but the Peruvian Defense Ministry published a photo of the CIA agent turned US ambassador Lisa Kenna meeting with the Peruvian defense minister, Gustavo Bolio. And on the day of the coup, he published a video which was broadcast all over the Peruvian media, which is dominated completely by the right-wing oligarchy. I mean, basically every media outlet in Peru is like Fox News. I mean, it's just, there's the media in Peru is deeply racist. They say openly racist things about indigenous people all the time. Of course, most of the hosts are like very light-skinned. They are very condescending against the leader, the president, Pedro Castillo. They um, constantly accused him of terrorism without any actual evidence. 
which is a complicated thing I can get to in a second. Going back to the Fujimori dictatorship, he accused anyone who opposes dictatorship of being a terrorist and killed and tortured and imprisoned and exiled and disappeared thousands of leftist dissidents. Anyway, the point is that um, Pedro Castillo, he was trying to dissolve Congress and the media now is accusing him of being a dictator for trying to dissolve Congress. But if you look at what the protesters are saying in Peru, if you look at their signs and their chants, they're calling for closing Congress. So ironically, even though he was basically a lame duck president as soon as he entered, the, the, his attempt to dissolve Congress was probably the most popular decision he made as president. And now that's being used to portray him as a dictator, which is preposterous. Oh, yeah. And sorry, I'm sorry. I, I was going to finish that thought that Gustavo Bobbio, the defense minister, on the day of the coup, he published this video broadcast by the media in which he told the military to go against Castillo. And he said that Castillo is launching a coup. So clearly, he was discussing something with the U.S. ambassador. Clearly, there was, by the way, I should mention that this was not a surprise that the coup was going to try to overthrow Castillo. It was known before December 7th. So it's very likely, we can only speculate, but it's very likely that the U.S. government was behind the scenes working with opposition figures to try to whip enough votes to impeach, to overthrow Pedro Castillo, and that they knew that there was going to be the vote the next day. And if Castillo was going to try to stop something, she met with the defense minister to make sure that he would order the military to, to go against Pedro Castillo, to not go along with his presidential decree to dissolve Congress. And this is very similar, by the way, to a similar coup that happened in Pakistan back in April against the Democrat elected prime minister Imran Khan, who was also overthrown in a parliamentary coup and replaced with a completely unelected corrupt coup regime and that has refused to have new elections and has been working with the IMF, of course, and imposing neoliberal austerity policies. And in that coup, the uh, parliamentary coup against Imran Khan in Pakistan in April, there were um, Pakistani media outlets that published photos showing the US ambassador meeting with opposition lawmakers who voted to impeach Imran Khan. So it's it's not just empty speculation. There's we can I think there's quite a bit of um, circumstantial evidence su to su suggesting that the US ambassador was working with the opposition in the Congress to try to whip enough votes to overthrow uh, Pedro Castillo. And as as you mentioned already, they've also played a very important role in consolidating the coup. I, I, I haven't and I haven't seen anyone uh, look at Canada's role over the past year and a half vis-a-vis uh, -vis Castillo, and I, I presume they were doing at, at minimum subtle things to undermine him, but I, I have not, uh, I haven't taken the time to do the deep, the deep dive, and I haven't seen anyone else do that, and I do uh, hope that that will happen in coming days and weeks. What is absolutely clear about the Canadian perspective is that they immediately supported it. At the Organization of American States, the Canadian government immediately said, basically blamed Castillo. This is, Castillo was the one that, that was perpetrating the coup. And then over the past uh, week or 10 days, a number of statements from the Canadian government that very much echo the U.S. position. On Saturday, uh, Melanie Jolie uh, tweeted that she tweeted, quote, spoke with Peru's foreign minister, Ana Cecilia Gervasi, to reiterate our support for the transitional government of President Boluarte. And then a couple of days before that, Canada's ambassador, uh, Luis Marcot, met uh, the, foreign, the new de facto foreign minister, uh, Gervasi, and said, quote, today with Minister Gervasi, put out a, a photo uh, with, with him and, him and uh, her, saying, today with Minister Gervasi, reiterated support for the transition government of President Dina Boluarte to create consensus leading to transparent and fair elections that will bring social peace, condemned violence and affirm, and affirm the right to peaceful assembly. But of course, no clear uh, you know, blame of who, who, is, uh, who is responsible for the, for the violence and, and the killing. And, and so that uh, you know, gets me to some of what's going on. It, it seems to be quite significant protests uh, in response to Castillo being overthrown. And there's also, I should, I should state really clearly, while the Canadian foreign minister and uh, ambassador are, are meeting with uh, Boluarte's uh, government 
they have brought in martial law. They have troops, they've sent troops to the street. They've killed at least two dozen. I think the, the numbers are, are a little unclear there. Um, so this is, I mean, this is some pretty extreme kind of repression, uh, which is, I think, in large part, response, uh, response to the, the popular uh, backlash. Yeah, I mean, I'll talk about the protests in a second because they're very important. But you mentioned a very important phrase that I want to just dissect for a second. The U.S. and Canada, when, when their support for the coup in Peru, have praised the so-called transitional government. This is not a transitional government. And Dina Boluarte and the Congress have made that clear. Boluarte has said her intention is to, is to continue the rest of Castillo's term. By definition, that is not a transitional government. Calling it a transitional government is false. She has said, well, I should point out, she was vice president of Castillo, but she was expelled from the leftist party Peru Libre that Pedro Castillo had campaigned on when he ran for president. She was expelled in January of this year. And, and she said, condemning the party, she said, I never believed in the ideology. Clearly, she didn't believe in the ideology of the party because she's formed a political alliance with not just the right wing, with the Fujimoristas, the most far right, viciously fascistic elements of Peruvian society who are deeply racist against the indigenous. So when they say that they, when the U.S. and Canada act as though this is a temporary transitional government, that is false. That is why the government, uh, so, I, so I said she was vice president of Castillo and plans to stay in his term. The coup regime, the presidency and the Congress, they have recently had a vote and they refuse to vote for new elections. They, are saying they, they have made it clear that they do not plan on having new elections until the presidential term of Pedro Castillo ends. So this is not a transitional government. Why are they, are they doing that, of course? Because she already announced her cabinet, and her cabinet is full of right-wing operatives. Immediately on the day of the coup, literally two hours after Pedro Castillo made his announcement of trying to dissolve the Congress, he was minutes later, he was in prison. Immediately after, and two hours after, she was appointed president by the opposition-controlled Congress. And in her speech, she vowed what she called a political truce, and she said that she's going to create a government of national unity. Obviously, what that means is the right wing is going to be in the government. Now, no one can, with a straight face, call that a democracy because the right wing lost the elections. So the right wing lost the elections. They overthrew the elected president and they found a new puppet who is creating an, an, a so-called coalition government with the right wing that lost the election. That is not a democracy. That is not a transitional government. I just wanted to make those points because... There are, because this coup is not as cut and dry and clear as a straight up military style old coup like we saw during, you know, the first Cold War Operation Condor, because it's a little more subtle in a gray area, I just wanted to talk about those main points so people can understand. Now you asked about the protests. These are massive all over the country, especially in the Southern region and the West, especially in the Andes and the mountains, um, places like Cusco, um, th these are the areas where the majority of working class indigenous descent Peruvians live. And this is this is the mass base for Pedro Castillo. Now, Lima, the capital, which is a big city, has typically been dominated by a lot of elites, not only economic oligarchs, but in, just in general, the political class tends to be very racist. There, there's a, I mean, there's, of course, a huge class element of this, but there's also a major racist element. Because Peru, like Bolivia, as it's you know, as countries in the Andes with very large indigenous populations that have been dominated historically by European descent elites, including I want to stress this point again: not only people who are descendant of Europeans, but in some cases descendants of fascists who fled to Latin America after World War II. People know there's all these stereotypes about Nazis in Argentina, although way more Nazis went to the U.S. than went to Argentina. That's never talked about or Canada, by the way, including in like the Ukrainian diaspora in Canada. But the point is that, you know, the CIA had this operation paperclip in which they took thousands of Nazis to the U.S. The CIA was working with them and, and they worked at NASA and the Pentagon. So anyway, the country in the Americas that took the most Nazis after World War II was the U.S. But there are a lot of stereotypes about Argentina and Nazis. but there were also Nazis and fascists who went to Brazil, a lot of them, 
who went to Chile and who were part of the Pinochet dictatorship, who went to Bolivia, and they were part of dictatorships in Bolivia, including in the 1980s, including this notorious, horrible fascist Hugo Banzer. Um, and of course, some of them also went to Peru. So uh, when, I, when I say that, you know, this deep-seated racism is an element, I mean, it's not a coincidence that after the coup in 2019 in Bolivia against Evo Morales, in, in the major hub of Santa Cruz, which I've been in in Bolivia, I've been reporting there after the coup, Santa Cruz has something called the Pro Santa Cruz Civic Committee, which is a um, very prominent group in the city of Santa Cruz that was founded by Croatian immigrants who were part of the Ostasha, who were Nazi collaborators. And after World War II, they fled to Bolivia and basically took over the city of Santa Cruz. And still today, they have huge influence. And you can see videos of them Nazi saluting in the streets. And they were like the main muscle behind the coup in Bolivia. So in Peru, it's not the same as Bolivia, but there are a lot of similarities with the 2019 coup in Bolivia. And one of the similarities is that after the 2019 coup in November in Bolivia against Evo Morales, the coup regime solidified its power with violence, with coups, uh, with um, massacres, specifically in the cities of Sencata and Sacaba. And, and I've been there. I interviewed victims in Bolivia. I mean, it's just a horror show. That's exactly the same strategy now being used by the Peruvian coup regime to solidify its control is a massacre. And at least in a conservative estimate, 25 protesters have been killed. At least 400 have been injured. And, you know, those numbers are always conservative because they're from local, you know, human rights groups. They can only they can only count as many people as they have resources to count. So there are photos of some of these human rights groups in Bolivia and excuse me, in Peru, posting photos um, on social media of hospitals, especially in the air in the city of Ayacusco, which is a largely indigenous base for Castillo, just full of people. Um, they were, that are wounded in these hospitals. So it's it's a massacre. And there is videos on social media that show the military and the police just flooding the streets, like insanely disproportionate numbers of military and police. I have some of them embedded in the articles I have at multipolarista.com. And also the official government human rights watchdog in Peru, which is technically autonomous, but it's part of the government, even they have criticized the coup regime. They published a statement and they said that the military and the police in Peru are using helicopters and they are shooting at protesters with live ammunition and dropping tear gas bombs on protesters from helicopters. So it is, it is very extreme. And it's why uh, civil rights, uh, civil society organizations in Peru and especially left-wing groups, are accusing the coup regime of state terrorism. There, I've seen that, that term used by numerous uh, human rights groups and parties in Peru say state terrorism. They're also accusing the regime of fascism. And just this week, the, the so-called counter-terrorism police in Peru, which have their origins in the Fujimori dictatorship, and which carried out genocide against indigenous peoples, um, the so-called anti-terrorism police stormed the headquarters of numerous left-wing organizations in Peru and imprisoned their leaders, including the, the um, Campesino Feder Confederation of Peru of peasants and farmers. They stormed their headquarters and imprisoned their leaders. They also stormed the headquarters of the, the Peruvian Socialist Party and another left-wing party in Peru called Nuevo Peru that's led by Veronica Mendoza, who is a feminist and leftist activist. They imprisoned their leadership and even these organizations, they posted videos in which their activists said that the police is planting weapons in their headquarters to accuse them of so-called terrorism. So th this is a dictatorship is what we're seeing. And it's a dictatorship that has the full backing of the U.S. and Canada, along with, by the way, the fascist Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil. So, you know, while uh, Joe Biden and Justin Trudeau try to portray themselves as you know, uh, you know, card carrying liberals who support, you know, feminism and anti-racism. They're they're literally allied with Jair Bolsonaro, the most vicious fascistic force in Latin America in supporting this coup in Peru right now. Yeah, even even the CBC had an article where it talked about how Canada was uh, the sort of division in the hemisphere where there's 15 countries. I think the CBC article said that have criticized uh, Castillo's ouster. And uh, and Canada, of course, is on the side of those who is not criticizing 
Um, so there, there's a before opening it up to, uh, to questions to from the audience. I just I also, also want to say there is there are some I haven't seen this well documented, but there are major Canadian economic interests in Peru. Peru, of course, is a big mining country, and Canadian mining companies are fairly significant players. Not as not as dominant in Peru today as as they are in some other countries. Uh, they have been more dominant. I think going back a decade or so ago, Canadian companies were maybe dominant or. 30, 40, 50 percent of the mining sector. Also, Scotia Bank and some Canadian banks are, are pretty significant players. And I just saw that Scotia Bank actually just inst instigated a um, investment tribunal lawsuit for like 130 million dollars from the the international the IC, IC, ISD, uh, the World Bank's um, uh, tribunal that allows corporations to sue governments uh, internationally. Uh, over some dispute going back uh, quite a few years. So, so Canadian, there are significant Canadian capitalist interests in uh, Peru, which I'm sure are, are shaping uh, the policy. We know that historically Canadian, Canadian diplomats have have very much advanced the interest of Canadian mining companies um, in in uh, Peru. One one point I just got, I guess maybe just throw it out there, throw it out there to you. I think one thing for for progressives in Canada that's important uh, to to um, a lesson that comes out of these things is that when there is a an ouster of a of a left leaning a leader in the hemisphere, probably the world at this point, but certainly in the hemisphere, we should be assuming that I think most progressives in Canada assume that the U.S. probably had some role in it, but we should also be assuming that Canada has some role in it, and that should be the starting point. If if you know the, if the evidence is not there, then we will not accuse wrongly. But you, usually the evidence is there, and so so I think it is really important that that when there is a left wing uh, uh, leader ousted, that we that we start from the assumption that Canada probably had a some form of hand in it, and try to uh, to uncover that hand and to oppose uh, uh, that. Um, the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute put out a action alert today. Uh, calling to email Foreign Minister Jolie and the opposition critics to oppose uh, Canada's role in supporting this this uh, uh, murderous uh, uh, government. So I invite people to to uh, to sign that uh, to email. Um, but uh, but uh, I'll I'll maybe just start with uh, with Yuri. Go ahead uh, with your question, Yuri. Thanks, Eve. Uh, hey, hey, Mr. Norton, it's such an honor to have you on Eve's uh, program. Big admirer. Of yours from your from your days at Fair Salon, <laughs> Moderate Rebels, and so forth. And uh, but yeah, so my questions are this. Uh, so I, you know, I live in Belgium, and I'm just curious. Uh, what's the EU's response been to? What's the EU's response been to the uh, coup that's going on in Bolivia? Uh, you know, in in Peru. Can you give us any updates on what's going on in Bolivia with the far right violence there? And what do you think needs to, uh, what do you think the mass government and the people power movement in Bolivia needs to do long-term wise to eradicate the far right from the military and the uh, police? And can you also talk to us about what's going on with this, uh, with, with this lawfare case that happened against uh, the Argentinian uh, uh, Vice President Christina Krishner, and also debunk a little bit the stereotypes about uh, about Argentina being this uh, haven, because there is a lot of, uh, well, yeah, talk to us about that. Yeah, great questions. I'll respond to all of them in a second. I just, because um, he's mentioned a really good point about uh, corporate interests in Peru. And Peru is a major mining hub. It also has some somewhat substantial gas reserves. I just want to really quickly um, name the top exports of Peru. And that, that really just answers everything about corporate interests in the country. The top exports of Peru are copper ore. And these are the, the 2020 statistics. It, <laughs> it exported $9 billion of copper in 2020. Gold, it exported $6.5 billion of gold in 2020. Copper, $2 billion. And petroleum gas. So Massive mineral reserves, including copper, gold, and uh, also gas. So it's clear uh, Canadian mining companies, U.S. mining companies, I'm sure European mining companies. In fact, I went back and I was trying to do research on Lisa Kenna, the CIA agent turned U.S. ambassador in Peru. 
And I, I went back and I checked out her congressional hearing with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee when she was asked to, uh, by asked questions by the congressional, uh, the, the U.S. Congress to get approval to be ambassador. And she mentioned the importance of mining interests in Peru. And all, she also stressed the role of Peru in in um, joining the U.S. coup attempt against Venezuela. So uh, as for your questions, I'll start with Bolivia you asked about. Um, the situation in Bolivia is is much obviously much better than in Peru for a variety of reasons. First of all, Peru is probably the most right wing government in Latin America. Colombia is up there with Peru, but Colombia finally has a left wing government for the first time ever. Peru, it did have a left wing government for uh, about 17 months and it wasn't allowed to do anything. The right-wing oligarchy in Peru is completely vicious. It's not a coincidence that Peru is also one of the most unequal countries in the Western Hemisphere. So the left in Peru is very weak. It's very unorganized. There are unions and there's a, there's a labor struggle that is pretty powerful, especially in indigenous communities and among some mining sectors, but they don't really have any political representation. And the, the Peruvian left is also uh, very divided because Really, what happened in the 90s is a complete disaster. I don't have time to get into it. But with Shining Path, which was a Maoist group, which was engaged in, in armed struggle against the Peruvian state, and it was also very sectarian, and, and Shining Path killed a lot of other leftists. And anyway, basically what happened is the Fujimori dictatorship used the existence of Shining Path as an excuse to just accuse anyone on the left of being a terrorist and just liquidated the Peruvian left. And ever since Fujimori left power in 2000, even though you know bourgeois democracy was restored in Peru, the left never really recovered from that. Um, now in Bolivia, the situation is completely different. In Bolivia, the movement towards socialism party, the MAS, M-A-S, is very powerful. And people, a lot of people don't know that the official name of the MAS party is, it's a very long and, uh, part name, but it's M-A-S hyphen I-P-S-P, which stands for Movement towards socialism hyphen the political instrument for the sovereignty of the peoples. What that means, and if you listen to speeches sometimes given by Evo Morales, who's still the leader of the MAS party, even though he's not president anymore, he will refer to the party as the political instrument. What is it the political instrument of? The social movements and the labor movement. So the MAS works very closely with the labor federations in Bolivia, which are very powerful, especially among indigenous workers and, and peasants and campesinos. So in Bolivia, the political power is rooted in the social movements and the labor movement. That's why after the U.S.-backed and Canadian-backed coup in 2019, they were able to come back to power just a year later in October 2020. Because of the power of the labor movement, they grinded the, the coup regime to a halt. And they had massive strikes and they block, blocked streets and all of that. Now, ever since the... October 2020 election in Bolivia. I was myself an international observer for that election. Ever since that election, the right wing in Bolivia has basically just tried to do the exact same thing, trying to overthrow the elected president, Luis Arce, who was economic minister under Evo Morales. And under his term, by the way, Bolivia's GDP per capita increased by 3.5 times. So massive economic growth. And meanwhile, during all the neoliberal governments for decades, economic growth was very tiny. So anyway, um, the current president, Luis Arce, he has faced a lot of opposition from these, these forces, but because one, they were so discredited by the coup in 2019, and two, because they, they only represent a small minority of the population, probably 10 or 15%, the government has still been able to govern pretty well. Now, I mentioned Santa Cruz, which is the main opposition hub in Bolivia, which is, you know, I mentioned a lot of these former fascists, you know, especially from the Croatian Ustasha. Um, they, in recent weeks, especially in November, they had an attempt at having a strike, which is hilarious because like almost no one participated because they have no working class support. They only have the support of like the wealthy oligarchs in Santa Cruz. They tried to have like this fake strike like a boss's strike, you know, like a, a like a boss's lockout. And like when like workers don't go on strike, but their bosses go on strike. It's very funny. Um, and then they they were very violent and they hired a bunch of just like thugs and and violent criminals to like burn down buildings, especially 
in Bolivia, these far right elements burned down the Union for Peasants in for Campesinos in Bolivia, which is exactly what the coup regime in Peru is now doing. It stormed the headquarters and arrested the leaders of the Campesino Confederation. So very similar tactics. Um, and we saw also a lot of racist violence against indigenous uh, Bolivians, but it just died out. I mean, they these fascist elements in Bolivia in November, they tried to have another coup on, on the anniversary, the third anniversary of the 2019 coup, and they didn't really get anywhere. I mean, if people want to get more information about that, I would recommend Kausachu News, an indispensable news source. And uh, my friends Ali Vargas and uh, Camila Escalante are doing great reporting on that from in Bolivia. Briefly, you asked about Argentina and the current vice president and former president, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner. Um, she, as she's known popularly in, in, in Argentina, she's just known as Cristina. Um, she basically is the victim now of a judicial coup. So I mentioned the lawfare, the legal warfare or judicial warfare being waged against Pedro Castillo in Peru. This is a tactic that we've seen against pretty much all left-wing governments in the region. In Brazil, President Lula da Silva was in prison in 2018 on completely fake charges. The, the Brazilian Supreme Court later dropped all charges against him and said he was innocent. And the UN Human Rights Committee also said that Lula da Silva was innocent and that the charges against him were fraudulent. And, they, and that the, the case in 2018 that imprisoned him violated his political and civil rights. And in 2016, uh, there was a, a very similar congressional coup that's very similar to this coup against Pedro Castillo now against Brazil's left-wing president, Dilma Rousseff, who also was the first ever female president of Brazil from the Workers' Party, the left-wing party of Lula. Now, the 2018 imprisonment of Lula was a coup that was used to prevent Lula from running in the 2018 presidential election. And that's the reason that fascist Jair Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro was able to become president. It was basically a stolen election because Lula was leading in all of the polls. So he was imprisoned by the CIA asset, a judge named Sergio Moro, who was then rewarded by becoming Bolsonaro's justice minister. And then immediately he and Bolsonaro visited CIA headquarters in Virginia, clearly to thank them for helping this so-called Operation Car Wash, this so-called anti-corruption operation. So that, that is the exact same playbook we now see happening in Argentina. There's an election coming up next year, 2023 in Argentina, and all of the polls show that the most likely candidate to win would be Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner. She is a leftist. Um, she governed for two terms as president, and she could technically govern again, but the right-wing corrupt uh, judiciary in Argentina, which has its origins in the Argentine dictatorship backed by the U.S., the, the most recent dictatorship in a military coup in 1976 that governed until 1983, and, and massacred leftists, killed thousands of leftists, disappeared many thousands. There are still, I have friends in Argentina who have family members they're still looking for to this day who were disappeared by the dictatorship. So the deeply corrupt right-wing judiciary has its origins in that dictatorship, and it never really was deeply reformed. And they've been waging just full-on legal warfare against Cristina and also her, her husband, her late husband, who was previous president, Nestor Kirchner, who passed away. And between 2004 and this year, the judiciary in Argentina has had 654 legal complaints against Cristina. And by the way, just so you, people can have an idea, six individuals were responsible for between 20 and 70 individual legal complaints against her. So this is a clear example of right-wing oligarchs and opposition figures in Argentina abusing the judicial system as a weapon against a popular left-wing leader. And then not to mention the media, which like, like in Peru, is just completely controlled by the right-wing oligarchy. Basically all media outlets in Argentina, excluding Pagina 12, every other media outlet is just completely right-wing and is controlled by the you know millionaire and billionaire oligarchs in Peru, uh, in Argentina, excuse me. And they just have constantly accused Cristina of, of corruption without any evidence and all this nonsense. So what happened on December 6th, one day before the coup in Peru, so there were two coups in Latin America in two days. In, in, on December 6th, 
the right wing corrupt judiciary accused for the first time, finally, after 654 attempts, they charged, they officially, not just, sorry, not just charged, they officially sentenced Cristina to six years in prison on this bogus corruption case. And there's evidence showing that the, the judicial sentence was written in 2019. The actual language of the decision was written back in 2019, but the opposition was waiting to use it because they didn't know if she was going to be presidential candidate. She ended up not being presidential candidate in the 2019 election. Instead, she's, she was going to be presidential candidate in the 2023 election. That's why they waited to have this judicial sentence until now. And she's sentenced to six years in prison, but that's not the real sentence. The other part of the sentence is that she can't run for president or any other public office mm -hmm. it, because of this, these, this sentence against her. So even if she appeals it, she has already said that she's not going to be presidential candidate in the 2023 elections, which basically means that there's probably a 90% chance the right wing is going to win the presidential election in Argentina because she was the most likely candidate. There's basically no one else who is popular enough to be president in Argentina. So it's a judicial coup that's modeled exactly in what happened against Lula da Silva in 2018 in Brazil. I had another question, but I'm going to save it for. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, we should, we should, yeah, yeah. Uh, go ahead, uh, uh, Kim. I believe I have Kim next. Wow, this this is so fascinating. I, yeah, you know, I admire all the minutia that you know about all these countries. <laughs> it's just, I've learned a lot in this, probably more than I knew in the last several years about these countries in the past few minutes. But seriously, I'd like to back it up a little bit and look at it from a geopolitical perspective. I mean, right now. Like there's a, it's a really interesting dynamic and it's becoming clear that the NATO countries are the terrorists. The NATO countries are are complicit. No, I am, I'm dead serious. Uh, they're complicit in a lot of these, these things. And it's really an anti-socialist movement. That's, that's the, the old order is trying to maintain its, its hold, its hegemony over the world order. And I think that uh, they're always bringing up, you know, the rules-based international order, what bullshit. But what is this order and how can we how can we leverage that? I mean, for example, there was a pipeline blown up, you know, the, the, the underwater pipeline. And there was all kinds of evidence that all the NATO countries were in on it. You know, Liz Trust saying it is done. And uh, and um, somebody tweeted, uh, was it Finland, the tweeted, uh, yeah. thank you, USA. Poland's former foreign minister and defense minister, he said, thank you, USA, and posted right. a photo of the right. exploded Nord Stream US pipeline. And we know that NATO countries are complicit and they're happy about that. And this is breaking international law. So this is this is major. How can we bring this into the international legal, like, like somebody said, lawfare? How can we take them to task for this? And you know, they just finished the COP15 here in Montreal for biodiversity, the, the, the talks for biodiversity to come to some kind. I mean, the world is dying. The world is dying because of this, because of these mining interests and because of this greed and because of the insistence on pursuing petroleum till, till the end of time. We have to, to like internationally, I mean, I, I have all the sympathy for Peru, but we can't get involved in their part. We have to step back and really address the biggest problem, which is the NATO oh, countries. And getting Canada out of NATO isn't even going to do it because this isn't isn't really the this isn't going to go anywhere as a as a campaign. We really have to address the crimes that are sitting there in plain sight. And bring is there is that crazy? Is there any way to do that? Is there any precedent for the U.S. ever interfering in the political um, uh, reality of another country and actually? failing because somebody sanctioned them for that just cuba well well failing in many cases but not because they were sanctioned the u.s never oh, faced this never been held to account why not yeah yeah great questions i mean i agree with you uh when when i was you know smiling when you said that they're terrorists i mean according to a consistent definition of terrorism absolutely it's state terrorism the u.s has consistently been responsible for state-sponsored terrorism including violent coup attempts uh, acts of sabotage against the civilian infrastructure of other countries that meets the international definition of terrorism, the use of violence for political ends. That's constantly what we see these Western governments do. But and it's funny you know, you to me, just to interrupt briefly, just then it's, it's, it's funny to me to think that you're somebody that is 
is so informed and that knows exactly what's going on in the, the reality that a lot of people are blind to. And even you kind of like, oh, why should we call them terrorists? Because that's what they are. But we're so indoctrinated that we don't even say what is and, and be able to accept it ourselves. And we're the left. So, yeah, well, I mean, I've, I've referred to them as uh, state, sp state sponsors of terrorism before in the past. But um, <laughs> no, I, I just, you know, I, I, I smiled because I agree with you. Anyway, the point is that, um, all right, so as for consequences, I mean, of course, there's no consequences because if you're the global hegemon by, by virtue of creating the international economic and political architecture, you face no consequences. I mean, let's not forget that the, the United Nations has its origins in the League of Nations, which was just a, an old boys club of all the colonial powers. And the UN Security Council is still deeply undemocratic. What are the countries that have permanent seats in the UN Security Council? the victors of World War II. So that's the US, Britain, France, Russia, and China. And actually Taiwan held China's seat until the 1970s, which is a, a, just a farce. And uh, you know, the US is a large country, Russia and China are large countries, but at this point, Britain and France are not very large countries. Why do they have permanent seats in the, in the UN Security Council and not India, which has 1.3 billion people, not Brazil, which has more of the population combined. If you take the population of, of, uh, of Britain and France and combine them, they're smaller than Indonesia. It's I mean, so it's, it's fair. It's, it's ridiculous. And the, and the veto, it's ridiculous. Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, there need to be completely new international institutions. I mean, and not even in terms of, you know, the economic architecture of the world, you know, the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944. How do we do it? <laughs> well, I mean, in the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944, let's not forget, you know, which was mostly Western governments, uh, the, the U.S. dollar was created as the global reserve currency, which is still the most powerful weapon of U.S. imperialism. I mean, the, the power of the dollar, which is still used in over 80 percent of global trade, it's also still used in 96 percent of trade in the Americas. Um, so Latin America is very heavily dependent on US dollars, which is what, how countries like Argentina can be trapped in unpayable odious debt owed to the IMF, which is basically an arm of the US government. So in terms of how can, how can countries do it, they are doing it right now. And I mean, anyone who's interested, I mean, I report on this stuff all the time at multipolarista.com. It's you know about this new multipolar world that we're living in increasingly. So in Latin America, it's a good example of this. Latin America is trying to create a new currency for bilateral trade between countries to get off the dependency on the US dollar. Lula da Silva, the president elect in Brazil who enters on January 1st, has pledged to create this new currency called the Sur, which means the South, creating a central bank of the South to unify so they can use trade the, the currency for bilateral trade. It's not going to be like the Eurozone. Countries will still have their own sovereign currencies, but they can use this this currency for trade between each other so they don't have to use US dollars. There's also, in, there are other organizations of regional integration in Latin America, like the Community of Latin American and Caribbean States, the CELAC, which is an alternative to the US dominated Organization of American States, which is really just, as Fidel Castro famously said, the Yankee Ministry of the Colonies. So the CELAC is an example. The Union of South American Nations, UNASUR, there are many organizations in Latin America trying to integrate the region and excluding the US and Canada. Also, increasingly, we see that Latin America is part of an international movement led by the Global South in institutions like the BRICS system that stands for BRIS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. This was created largely by the leadership of Lula da Silva in Brazil, and they created an alternative to the World Bank and they're trying to create new institutions to challenge the dictatorship of the US dollar, of the IMF and the World Bank, and even potentially a new payment mechanism to get around the Belgium-based payment system, the SWIFT messaging system, which the US uses to lock countries out of the interbank messaging system, to basically just lock them out of the international financial system. So the BRICS is involved with that, and the BRICS is growing. Um, Iran wants to join BRICS. Argentina wants to join BRICS. There are even reports, which I'm not entirely sure about, but potentially there are rumors that Turkey and Egypt and even potentially Saudi Arabia and Indonesia want to join the BRICS. So oh. BRICS is growing. 
We also see in, in Asia, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which so includes- So the US empire is, is dying. And these are the last, this is the, the coming to the violent, a violent uh, conclusion. Uh, what I would like to do is, is I, I like all what, all what you're saying should encourage me, but it's just something probably that the US and Canada and all the NATO countries have been watching happen or are determined to to stop and might makes right in the world order as it stands right now. And 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 we're, we risk nuclear war. So what I'm interested in is how can we um, leverage like the, the rule of law internationally? This is all good. Everything you're saying should be very encouraging, but it's kind of just feeding the flames of 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 revenge on the part of the, the US and everything else and and try they're trying to reestablish what they had and to re to, to turn the tide back to the way it was before all this started happening so do we have any recourse as an as activists within some of these countries that are Kim, uh, well, no, but I just want to, I want to just, just interrupt because we, we have a yeah, few sorry, people, we have a few people here and we're already after seven o'clock, but, but there, I mean, there's really concrete thing. I mean, the, the action alert around Canada's sport to consolidate this coup in Peru is a, you know, concrete example of doing something. Is it going to, you know, change Canadian policy? In I want to sue the U S though, in the international court of law. I don't want to, you know, I, I, yeah, I want to, and, 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 but and, I don't think that's going to change the overall dynamic of, but but yeah, I don't. Uh, I, I have a few ideas. I'll briefly say, just briefly. Um. By the way, Nicaragua's Sandinista government sued the U.S. government in the International Court of Justice and won the case. And what was the response of the U.S.? It refused to pay the billions of dollars. And still today, the U.S. refuses to pay Nicaragua for the billions of dollars. And uh, the, the International Court of Justice declared that the U.S. was responsible for state state sponsored terrorism for supporting the Contra death squads. So um, that's an example. I mean. When you're a hegemon, you can just ignore international law. But I think there are things that can be done that are that are tangible actions. One, every country that's in NATO, sh there should be a campaign in that country to withdraw from NATO and to dissolve NATO. I mean, that should be number one on the list of the anti-war movement. Canada should not be in NATO. NATO should not exist. Two, um, calls for uh, abolishing or at the very least uh, democratizing the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. The U.S. government is the only country with veto power, which basically makes it an arm of the U.S. government. Um, there are alternatives that are that are being created. I mean, I personally think they should be abolished, but um, calls for you know um, reforming or abolishing the IMF and the World Bank and creating other forms of credit for the global South, which is extremely important because debt traps are a huge tool of imperialism. Another thing is calling for reforming and expanding the U.N. Security Council. Um, the UN Security Council should have permanent members that include the largest countries in the world. Um, other things that include um, is this written the, down somewhere. <laughs> um, the US, <laughs> the US should be a party to the the Rome Statute and the International Criminal Court, which it's not. There should be a campaign to force the US to become party to it. One of the reasons the US can't be held to account by the ICC is because it 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 refuses to abide by it. And the US government passed a law that it calls the Hague Invasion Act that says that if a US national or someone of interest to US foreign policy is tried at The Hague, the US reserves the so-called right to invade The Hague and take them out of the International Criminal Court. I mean, there should be international campaigns against all of these institutions, the UN, the Security Council, the IMF, the World Bank, NATO, they need to be either reformed or abolished and replaced with something that's actually democratic. I like that go, plan. Go, go ahead, John, go ahead, John. You're on mute. Yeah. Un unmute you. You got to unmute yourself, John. Okay. Well, um, um, I was going to let, let the discussion go. It's getting late, but uh, the the, uh, the Latin American countries are, have have uh, have gotten gotten rid of the OAS, and uh, they're say like I think is, is the new uh, uh, group. Is is that any any kind of force, or is uh, because it could be quite a powerful voice to counter uh, the United States in, uh, in, uh, in the South? Yeah, great question. I mean, I mentioned this earlier. The community of Latin American and Caribbean states, CELAC, was created originally by Hugo Chavez, the Venezuelan revolutionary president, to uh, be an alternative to the OAS, the Organization of American States, which was created by the US, in fact, a year before NATO. And it was the original kind of like right-wing anti-communist alliance before NATO was created but it was for Latin America. And 
Founding members of the Organization of American States included right-wing dictatorships like the right-wing um, dynasty, the military dynasty that controlled Nicaragua of the Somoza family. So um, just as NATO was also founded by fascist dictatorships, including the Portug Portuguese fascist dictatorship, which had been an ally of Hitler's Nazi Germany and of Mussolini's Italy, um, the Portuguese fascist dictatorship was a founding member of NATO. Similarly in OAS, the OAS is similar. So the, the CELAC has become a major force and increasingly the OAS has no legitimacy in Latin America among the left-wing presidents. And we see that next year there's gonna be another annual summit of the CELAC. The CELAC just had their annual summit this year in Mexico City and I reported on it. And, and, it, and it's, a, it's a very a clear sign of Latin America moving in a more independent direction. And like I was saying earlier, it's a sign of this move toward a multipolar world where we see different regional blocks like Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa, and Latin America creating their own institutions because they recognize that the international institutions that do exist are so undemocratic and so dominated by the Western powers, they have to create their own. I just also just wanna to add to make that clear. So Canada is the one, US and Canada are not part of CELAC. And Canadian officials have repeatedly uh, been hostile to the Latin American integrationist uh, efforts, including, of course, uh, CELAC. Go ahead, uh, Francisco. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll be quick. <clears throat> Just a couple of points and a, and a quick question. Um, I think we should, for the purpose of this discussion, remember that uh, Canada, as is on the Canada website, uh, Canadian government website. Canada, Peru is uh, Canada's second largest uh, bilateral trading partner in South and Central America. I think we should remember, like they're like right there at the top, and so that has an effect on how how Canada plays into this. And that we should also remember uh, the Canadian Armed Forces um, involvement in Peru in 1997 during the Japanese Embassy hostage crisis and against the Tupac Amaru revolutionary movement. Um, so Canadian commandos from JTF2 were directly involved in, um, in that operation. And so Canada has a history not only of affecting the, the economics of the country, but direct, direct military involvement. And how that has matured to now uh, is, is anybody's guess, but there's, Canada does have a, a military history in Peru advising uh, special forces um, and and then also firing bullets. Um, my question, I'm just wondering if you could speak really uh, about what is the current status of indigenous armed movements within Peru? Um, how, how have things changed? What, what are things like on the ground right now in terms of that indigenous resistance? Thank you. Yeah, well, I don't know of any armed groups that are still active in Peru. You mentioned the um, Tupac Amaru movement, which was probably the best of all of the left-wing groups and parties in Peru. And um, unfortunately, a lot of them were actually killed by Shining Path. So it's a very complicated story. And, uh, and, then, and then you mentioned the Japanese embassy um, taking hostage taking, which is a very complicated story. But anyway, the point is that um, really since the 90s, pretty much all the armed groups were just completely destroyed by the Fujimori dictatorship. I mean, it was extremely bloody and the Peruvian left has never really recovered. So in terms of the Peruvian organized left, the only real political parties, there are three main left-wing parties. And um, the one that Pedro Castillo had campaigned on is Peru Libre, which technically according to its party constitution is a Marxist-Leninist party. And um, it has kind of become like a more... Um, like a left-wing leftist nationalist party, but it's probably one of the better parties in, in Peru. Um, there's also the Peruvian Socialist Party, which is not very big and it's not great. Um, and it's not very indigenous. Unlike Peru, Peru Libre has a lot more indigenous support. The Socialist Party is kind of like more academic. And then there's also another significant leftist party, which is kind of like, you know, a social democratic, but a, a more like left wing of social democracy. And that's the, um, that's New Peru, uh, Nuevo Peru which is led by Veronica Mendoza, who is a well-known feminist. And she also has worked a lot with indigenous communities in Peru. So really the two main parties on the left in Peru are Peru Libre and Nuevo Peru. And they, they basically formed an alliance after Castillo won the election. Veronica Mendoza, a lot of people assumed she was going to be the left-wing presidential candidate. 
but surprisingly ended up being Castillo because he's himself an, of indigenous descent. Um, I don't, again, I don't know of any armed groups, but what I can say um, is that with the coup regime and its violence right now, they're basically asking for reviving the armed groups that were active in Peru for many decades. Uh -huh. So, so uh, uh, it's after it's after seven, and uh, this was a great this was a great uh, discussion, Ben. Thanks a lot uh, for coming on. It was it was very informative, and uh, yeah, I, I uh, uh, thank everyone for uh, for participating. Uh, next week there won't be uh, uh, because it's uh, Boxing Day. There won't be a, a Canadian Foreign Policy Hour, but uh, we'll start up back in the uh, in the new year, and again. Thanks a lot, uh, Ben, for, for coming on for this uh, great discussion. And uh, have a good night, everyone. And uh, happy, happy holidays. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.